Great. So thanks for doing this, Terry. Really exciting to get to chat to you. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about you, and I'm going to see whether this is how you would describe yourself. But, uh, see if I recognise myself is what this is about, really. <laughs> well, so Terry's a Python, an incredibly talented artist, a pioneering animator, and I would describe you as a wildly unpredictable filmmaker, having made some really incredible, and I mean incredible in the truest sense of the word, films including things like Brazil, Jabberwocky, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, 12 Monkeys. Uh, when when, somebody, when I, somebody like me says that about you, what bit of that resonates, what bit of that doesn't sit comfortably? Well, I don't know, I, I think the wildly... Uh, it, it, wildly... <laughs> it all sits fine. I mean, I just, the fact that I remember it in any way, in any way, is is triumph enough, <laughs> it seems to me. <laughs> well, this is, um, you really kindly suggested that we get some questions from students. And so I've got that, and I'm going to go to those in a minute. We've got about a dozen okay, great. Yeah. But before we do that, why, it might be illustrative for them just to hear about how you actually first got started. When, when do you think you got started as a filmmaker? What was the moment that sort of happened? Uh, well, it was really, I suppose, when it happened, when in a meeting, a Python meeting, it was discussed about who would direct Holy Grail. And it was agreed that two guys named Terry would get the job. And that was it. I started at the top. I've been working my way down ever since. <laughs> and so was it, was it a competition? Was, was there discussion within the, among the other Pythons that any of them might want to direct or did they all stand back? And no, they had no interest in it. They understood it was a dog's body job and that they just wanted to be able to flounce around in comfortable clothing. And, uh, and that's how it went. Terry and I were convinced we knew how to direct movies. The fact is neither of us had directed a movie at that point. And so we learned on the job. It's quite extraordinary to be thrown into that kind of situation yeah. where the money is there and we took off. What was interesting about it for me and probably for Terry was that we were in such total agreement about everything as we were preparing, as we were finding locations, planning the whole thing. Once we started shooting, it was like two different voices going in different directions. <laughs> but we sorted out and made a rather good little film for hardly any money. Fantastic film. Well, that's a quite a nice pivot into our first kind of student question, because Jess Woodland, who's on our post-production supervision course, she wrote, a mythical being has allowed you to go back in time and impart one piece of valuable advice to yourself at the beginning of each of your decades from 20 till now. What different pieces of advice would you choose to pass on at each of these moments in time that you now recognise would have best served you for the coming decade? Well, strangely enough, I don't think I could advise myself in any way, because uh, were I to advise myself now, I, my cynicism would get in the way. Mm -hmm. My belief in the impossibility of achieving anything would, would hamper anybody I was advising. So I'd rather stay out of that one. And I just was very lucky. Everything seemed to go smoothly. I think I made reasonably good choices, mainly because I knew what I didn't want to do. I seldom knew at any stages of my life what I really wanted to do. But at each point, I, I just knew what I didn't want. So basically that closed most of the doors of possibility. And, and that was great. The other thing I knew very early on, the rules I set myself were, I would never work for money for the sake of the money. Uh, and whatever I did, I must have total control over. And that was a start, which kept every possible investor a long way away. <laughs> and, and so I made do with a piece of paper and a pen and drew cartoons. That's how it works. <laughs> that, that's total control at that point, isn't it? Because you don't need anybody else's money to do that. No, it's cheap, piece of paper and a pen. That's it. It's my life, however long I spend drawing. It's yeah. my problem. And as... With success and getting into films, of course, everything became more difficult because you're dealing with very large sums of money. And the larger the sum, the more you're surrounded by sort of the, what, how can you describe them? 
the assholes of flies or flies of assholes. I'm not sure which way it goes because money attracts flies and assholes. <laughs> <laughs> it's what it does. But but I think I had the advantage of being part of a group called Monty Python, who were quite early on successful in television. And then when it came to like Holy Grail, the money to make the film all came from, you know, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Elton John, several big um, record companies. We were beloved by the pop world. Yeah. And so we were in a position of having, as a group, total control of the film. What we wrote, what we did was all ours. And so once you've been in that privileged position, it's very hard to go backwards. <laughs> At least. And so it, a certain arrogance, I suppose, was built up by getting away with murder on the first time out. <laughs> I didn't know that actually about the funding of the films. I mean, that, that's really fascinating because it means that they were really investing because they loved what you do, not because they thought it was going to make them a lot of money. That was everything in my life has always been that. I'm only moved by being obsessed or taken over by an idea or, or just the joy of doing the work. Yeah. It has to be that. I, I can't, I've had enough bad jobs in my life to know working for money is not the way to go through life. <laughs> Right, Steve's got a question from the animation course. He says, people often say they don't know where to start with a project, but how do you know where to end? Is it possible or is nothing ever truly complete? No, I'm happy to complete things and get, a, get those ideas and, and whatever I've done out of my life because invariably, especially making a film, you know, you're involved for such a long time in preparation, raising the money, right? So by the time, you get to a point, I just want this out, gone, and deadlines and other people coming and saying, you're out of money, <laughs> helps enormously. Animation was, I was luckier again, because we were doing a television show and we had deadlines each week, we were on air and you had to finish. And I had to be able to bring the cans of my films into the studio the day we were shooting the studio. So I've always been, driven by deadlines and, and, and imprisoned by deadlines. I hate them most of the time, but they seem to be the most, impart, the most important part of the process. Because it means stuff gets done. And you yeah, can exactly. But it, it's interesting, you were saying kind of you want it out of your head. Is it because it kind of is an obsession while you're making it? So it's good to kind of finally put it to bed. Yeah, I think it's very tricky because Films are more difficult, you spend so much time and so you want to get it right. And there's always something you think is, well, if you can fix that, it'll be perfect. It actually happened with Brazil. On the day of the opening in Leicester Square, the Leicester Square Odeon, I was convinced there was one little moment that I had to get out of the film to make it successful. And I literally chopped the show print, boom, wow. and edited it back together. And that was it. Of course, it was ridiculous and I was wrong. The film worked with or without the piece. I put it back in when we actually did on uh, the DVD of the film. I stuck the moment back in. <laughs> you wouldn't, have, on the technical level, you probably wouldn't be able to do that now, would you? To it Because you could physically go in and change the print, but now with all the digital processes, it would be a much harder thing, I think. Mm, yes, probably. I mean, uh, but not necessarily. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do when you're, when you're in a crazed state. <laughs> <laughs> um, Will Linney off our commercials course has written, hey Terry, thank you so much for doing this. I have a question about your storyboards. How flexible are you with them in pre-production when collaborating with your cinematographer? And are you willing to adapt your shots on set if the blocking changes after suggestions from the actors? So I guess it's a question for you about how, how rigid yeah. are you around? I, I'm very flexible because, because I did them. They were my, the way I could imagine the film is what the storyboard's job is. I mean, once we have a script, I start drawing storyboards to create images or at least ideas of images, but they're not, they're not, I haven't drawn them in stone is what I haven't done. And I don't do what 
proper storyboard artists do, which they've got these very elaborate shots all drawn beautifully. I'm too lazy to do that. I just get the wide shot and there's close up there. I don't spend much time drawing the camera moves. I don't do that um, because that's what we do on the, on the day. And because for me, the amount of time I, still, I spend preparing, by the time we get shooting, I'm, I'm a bit too much of an automaton. I know it too well. And I want to be surprised every day by things going wrong or new ideas appearing that are better than the one idea that I had. It can be anybody's idea that I work with. I don't care. If it's a good idea, I grab it. And, and when the actors are there, and then at the beginning, I was much more rigid about what I wanted the actors to do. And over the years, I've I've just loosened it up because I want actors to have the room to deliver what they can deliver. It's pointless asking them to do exactly what I want to do or standing in just that position to get the light that way. I mean, I hate all that stuff. So I, as I've gone on, I give the actors more and more room to whatever feels right for them. And we can, can move the camera. We can adjust always to fit, fit that out. That's it. And so the, the storyboards become a jumping off point, do they, on set, rather, rather than a kind of a yeah. noose to tighten you around yourself? It, they're also useful for everybody else to see what I've got in mind. It's, it's one thing to be saying what you want. It's one thing to get the costumes right in the costume department and the sets right in the set. But the storyboards give an idea so anybody who wants to can see the film now i used to put those up on big boards on around the edge of the set but after a few times of doing that i realized nobody's looking at them anyway <laughs> <laughs> they're just ignoring I said, this is it but they're just ignoring me because they know better but but what happened where when i did time bandits we got in the situation during the big battle in the fortress of ultimate darkness at the end where you've got the tank bursting through the the wall and the cowboys right it was very complicated and a lot of things weren't working on the day they were supposed to work and luckily i had storyboarded it so i was able to say to the camera and everybody else this is the shot we need we need this shot and i could tick them off bing 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 and i remember the focus puller was a guy named Bobby Stillwell, who was an old pro. He had been with on David Lean. He had been Lords of Arabia. He had seen it all. And there's me, this young smart ass in there with his stupid piece, these stupid pieces of paper saying, we need that shot. We do that one. Got it, Bob. And everything was out of sequence. I was just grabbing the shots where they were possible to be got at the moment because we were running out of time. And he just thought I was completely off my head. This is not going to work, Terry. He kept reassuring me. And I said, shut the fuck up. We're going to do this. <laughs> Come on, Bobby, get out of the way. I know what I'm doing. And, and, and the great thing is at the end, when he saw the finished film, he looked at that and said, Terry, you were right. I had no idea that you were going to pull this thing off because it was <laughs> utter madness. <laughs> so Jack off screenwriting, he says... Do you think stories of tragedy have a place in today's mainstream comedy and action? He says, because it's a, it feels like a very comedy and action saturated market. Tragedy, we have it in our daily life now. Why do we want to sit and watch it on yeah. Netflix, I ask you? <laughs> tragedy is absolutely vital. And for me, it's co tragic comic. It's what I like. I like the combination. Uh, I just think at the moment, I when the this year's films came out and I had the screeners and was watching them and I have to vote uh, as a member of BAFTA, I abstained and they asked why they asked. And I said, because I don't think any of them are worthy of a BAFTA award is what I said. And I still feel that. I think there's some seems to be just, I don't know. I just feel nothing was done with any real strength and passion and and, and cinema, I see a lot of stuff that is just elaborated television is what it feels like. And it slightly bothers me. I must just say, I, I thought <laughs> a promising young woman- oh, was, I was gonna say. Exactly. Should be the best film. I think it was a wonderful thing. It was the smartest script of almost anything I saw. I, I agree with you about promising young woman. I think it's so, it's trying to be bold. It's trying to say something can be bold, yeah. provocative, and that's, that's cinema, isn't it? 
It makes you um, think and it surprises you. That's what yeah. it did. Because I started, I thought, oh, come on. I, I think I know where this is going. Of course, it didn't go there. Yeah. It was a nice surprise. And just the conceit was very good. I thought uh, Carrie Mulligan did a great job on yeah. it. Absolutely yeah. wonderful. Um, B says, so she's on our directing course. She says, as someone who writes a lot of stories about funeral directors, I'm always curious about people's after death plan. If you could have one last send off or lasting monument, regardless of budget and restrictions, what would it be? I know exactly what it'll be. I want to be buried uh, on the hill behind my house in Italy. I want to be put in the ground without a coffin and I want an oak sapling to be rammed into my chest. That's my send off. That's how I want to go. And uh, I'm making it public now because maybe it'll put some pressure on my wife who doesn't want to be hassled with dragging my dead corpse off to Italy. <laughs> it's a very specific plan, Terry. I like that you've got it really, you've got it really clear in your mind. I know. I, my afterlife wants to be spent as an oak tree. Yeah, I love that. Um, Steve Sale on a similar theme, he's on our online filmmaking course, he says, what is the meaning of life? What, what have you worked that out to be? I think to live is the meaning of life and that's it. Just live and get the most out of it. I think, I don't know, I'm not sure there is any meaning to life. That's one of the problems, but there is uh, a journey, a ride to take that one has got to grab it and, in, and make the most of it and not be frightened of it. And uh, I think that's it. I think I just, well, I'm, I'm just lucky because I've had a rather good one. I never had a plan and yet everything has come in surprising ways and I've achieved things I didn't aspire to achieve. <laughs> and that's quite nice. And I don't know how else one should go through life other than, other than determined to um, actually to do worthwhile things. I really think it's working. To me, I, I think myself first as a craftsman, a, a maker of things, and I want to leave things behind that hopefully have a positive effect on the world or those who are surviving in, in, in the business of life. I just, I, I've always, I mean, it's clear, I know what I want to do. I've always wanted to make people think and so I'm, I've always wanted to be a provocateur in the sense that I'm doing things that will anger some people, will delight other people, and surprisingly get a dialogue or at least a good argument between those two people somehow. But that's that's not really of the moment, is it? At the moment, uh, you know, in terms of people don't. We are living in a difficult subjects. We are living in a very sad time with the neo Puritans that are out there and the fundamentalists. Uh, there's a kind of fundamentalism that's creeping in. And the, the great loss is comedy and humor. I keep saying our seventh sense is in danger, and that's the sense of humor. And yes, you have to laugh, and everything needs to be laughed at it doesn't mean you're trying to destroy it yeah find the humor in things fine we are absurd species we are and if we can't enjoy that what the fuck do we think we're doing <laughs> um alex off our sound design course says hi terry my question is do you use or indulge in surrealism as a form of escapism from the rational or is it rather an equally valid perspective on the world for you I'm just a surrealist. I mean, it's that's the form of reality that I'm interested in, in the sure real world. It's I don't draw a line between fantasy and reality. It's all to me one an extension of the other, really. And what I like, I suppose, about surrealism as it is, it's it's always about juxtapositions putting two things or three things together that don't really belong together. And it plays with our minds because our minds want order and they want to construct order out of chaos. And if you put three things that have nothing to do with each other, our minds will try to put those together into something that makes sense. And that's good brain exercise. And that's what I'm into. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually on that note, Leto from our animation course wrote, 
What's your approach to constructing meaning in your films? Personally, I find it easier to see what I was really trying to say after the film's finished, when it becomes clear. I always feel like I'm a step behind my subconscious. Do you have a clear idea of what you're trying to say at the outset? Well, I try to uh, stay very close to my subconscious. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not a step behind it. I'm hoping to be walking alongside it. I think I find more about my films when I read reviews of them to discover that I've, to somebody else, it was a very different story mm -hmm. that I thought I was telling. And this could be good or bad. It's just different. I, I don't, I don't really know what I've made. And at the end, I know I've achieved the best I could out of the situation, the money, the timing, the actors I've got, the thoughts I had. That's it. And you finish it. And then I don't know whether I've made a good film or what I even think of it till hopefully about 10 or 12 years later, when I can just be a punter and be surprised. I mean, I remember when in the case of Brazil, and in most of my films get to the point it, as you're the final stages of editing and you start screening it to get opinions from other people. I go flipping back and forth. One time I watch it, I love it. Next time I watch it, I think it's a piece of shit. I hate it. And this, this back and forth that goes on until finally it's done and it's out of my hands. And then I, I remember with Brazil, I saw it years after I made, finished it. And I didn't know who made it. I didn't recognize the guy named Terry Gilliam who made that. I, I looked at the film, I said, I have no idea how to make this film now. And I, I liked that. I thought, that's what I want it to be. I don't want to be, I never feel I'm the owner of the film. The film has made itself. Mm. I keep saying, I'm just the hand that writes, but the film is making itself. And, and it's part of the joy of, of making films is I'm allowed to um, submit to a larger thing than me. I never think, think I'm doing it. The film is making it happen because there's so many events, failures, surprises that come along the way that adjust the film. It, so it ends up a slightly different animal or a considerable different animal than what I began with. And I, I love that, that's exciting. Yeah. Yvonne's asked a question, she's in our programming course, and she, she wrote a question, she said, the fraught process of filmmaking and stresses of fulfilling a creative destiny are laid bare in the recent documentary, He, D he Dreams of Giants. I wondered why your subsequent adventures in post-production were not covered. Are we to assume it was all plain sailing from then on? Uh, <laughs> That's said, the best question of all. <laughs> it, real, uh, it reveals the lie of He Dreams of Giants which should have actually been entitled, He Dreams of Giants, but Works with Dwarves. That would be an honest and accurate title. Now, I mean, Keith and Lou who made it, you know, that was the third, or was it the, four, the third documentary we had worked yeah. on together. And in the end, I said, listen, I think the film is very interesting, but it's not really my film. It's your film, Keith. It's your autobiography because I, in much of that, what I, what you see in it is the angst and the, the, what I'm going through is not what was really going through. I, a lot of that, when I got my heads in the hand, my head um, in my hand, heads in my hand is more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's when I've got my head back, I'm just grabbing a little bit of rest. That's all yeah. it was, because we you know, we work ridiculous hours. It's not me. I, I, oh, well, it's not that at all. And and I kept saying to Keith and Lou, the real story is Paolo Branco, who was for a while the producer, who completely went out of his way when he failed to raise the money to destroy the movie. While we were making it, he was doing his best. I mean, we, we were shooting in, in Portugal in this um, monastery called Tomar. And a week before we were to arrive there, he tried to get the judges of <laughs> Portugal to stop us turning up there. And he, when we finished the film, he then, we have been in lawsuits that are not finished yet. We still got a crucial one coming up in September this year. He went out of his way to destroy everybody who actually succeeded in making the film. And so the lawsuits are gone. He's actually 
He's probably bankrupted the Spanish company who actually made the film. It's been horrible. Uh, Jeremy Thomas was being sued by him because Jeremy was the executive producer for millions of dollars for not letting uh, Paolo make the film that he wanted to make. It's, it's, it's what, I mean, I've dealt with a lot of crazy people over the years, but he, he's the winner at the moment. <laughs> and so was post-production smooth? Because that's at the heart yeah, of Yeah, basically the actual editing was all there. All of that went fine and, and, and it was, except when we were in Brussels doing the final mix and suddenly I find out he's got all these lawsuits, which, at, which encouraged Amazon to walk away from the project. That Amazon were on up till the final mix when all of these legal threats that were going on. He actually managed to get legal letters out to every distributor that was involved in the film. And most of them ran away because nobody wants to be involved in that kind of nonsense. So he, in the sense, he destroyed the film, uh, I suppose, commercially, you could say, but the film is alive yeah. and it'll be out there. Yeah. Um, Heru, who's on our filmmaking course, she, she's asked a question which I'm actually interested in because you've, you've, you're always somebody who moves in form and style. You're not kind of just a straight live action filmmaker. So she asks, have you ever considered a telling a story through video games? Is games something that's of interest to you? I could imagine Brazil and Baron Munchenhausen as first person interactive games. Yes, I have thought of all of that. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't interest me anymore. It did years ago, much more. I'm, video games are what they are. I really don't think it's the best way I want to encourage people to spend their lives. I'd rather them spend their lives in dark cinemas watching <laughs> stories rather than thinking they are you know, uh, a sword wielding uh, giant or whatever. Grow up, people. <laughs> it's, it's, video games are, are too simple it's too simple the cathar cathartic nature of them i remember when my son was 12 he had tony hawk's uh, skateboard uh, thing uh, which he was having a wonderful time skating zipping up in the air crashing to the ground and i said come on this is this isn't real come out into the street which he did of course falls down the blood starts flowing the pain <laughs> starts throbbing and i thought that's learning something the other is not that's just fantasy land <laughs> yeah we're almost at the end penultimate question so tess asks and she's on our animation course she says have you considered doing animation again maybe directing another animated feature i don't know i i'm so much in love with working with real actors on the set. I mean, I just find the experience is much more interesting because there's they're brilliantly talented people with ideas and I've got to test my own ideas about, about that. I don't know. I think animation is another one because I always felt animation was so kind of lonely doing it. On the other hand, I had complete control, so I shouldn't be complaining, uh, but it's, it's the social. <laughs> aspect of making movies that I really enjoy. Now, I suppose an animated film, you get to spend a year with other animators and you've got real control, but real control doesn't interest me in the way it used to. And that's why making live action movies, I mean, it's a more dangerous job, but because you've got to go in there and hopefully get it right. I never reshoot anything. I'm doing, I'm pretty much a believer one go if you miss it you've lost it and you move on and it makes it uh, it just makes it more stressful and adventurous is all i can say and the whole thing feels more alive in that moment yeah everything but me feels alive yeah <laughs> <laughs> right renee's got our final question so she says i've actually got two questions wrapped up into one so i hope that's okay she's uh -oh. being greedy but it's not often. I'll have one answer wrapped up into two. So <laughs> it'll sort of balance. She says, I'm being greedy, but I don't often get a chance like this to talk with you. So she says, if you could do it all again, what would you do differently, if anything? And if you had a chance to create a new hybrid story experience for future audiences, what would it be? Thanks for your time. Well, I, I wouldn't do it again. I've been lucky enough. I got away with enough murder that I wouldn't want to tempt <laughs> fate again. What I want to, I don't know what I want to do with this. I'm actually going through probably the, the moment when you realize your muse has left you and you're 
just accepting a lot of awards from festivals for lifetime achievement, which means it's the golden watch, 40 years of service to the industry. Now, fuck off, Gilliam. <laughs> That's some young people work. <laughs> So I don't know. I'm not. I'm the the odd thing is the the I want to say the festival. I was going to say the the pandemic. I thought it would be a perfect time to just really be creative, I'm coming up with all sorts of ideas. I could be drawing like that. I could do everything. It's been the opposite. It's some, and I suddenly realized I'm much more dependent or reactive to civilization throbbing away. And the minute when you realize the world has stopped. What's my point in it? What's any of our point in it is what it's yeah. about. And uh, and so it's been a very funny time. I'd like to get another job before I'm dead though. So anybody listening who happens to have a few million, I'm the, I'm your guy. Perfect. Well, <laughs> listen, I'm gonna sneak, I'm gonna be cheeky and sneak in a question just to yeah. so I've got, you know, about 500 young filmmakers here who all want to build a life in. Where are they? Where are the they? Yeah, yes, the school. This is your fantasy. You are alone. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> You're just fooling me to make an old man feel like somebody's interested in what I've got to say is what no, you no, no. <laughs> And so I wondered, I wondered, you know, this is a really important moment for them. So what, have you got any advice, you know, to people who are right at the beginning of their career? What can they do to make sure when they get to Probably your not. career is fulfilled? I think you've got to do what you believe in, what excites you, what thrills you, what, you know, what gets the juices flowing. Otherwise, you might take any job out there if that's it. You just need money. That's you work for money. But but I just think it's the joy of making things. On the other hand, I don't encourage people to become uh, film directors. It's a really tough job. And well, at least it's a tough job if you want to be the kind of director I, I admire. The people that have got a signature, a, a, a unique view of the world. You can be another kind of director which works on Netflix all the time. And they're good. There's so many technically skilled people out there, but they're people without anything that they really want to say. And, and for me, cinema has always been about, hopefully something is close to a single voice talking to you from a big screen as you're sitting there with your popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, we, you were kind enough before we started this to say that you would send a little personal gift to the person who asked the best That question. wasn't kindness, I was forced into it by my agent. <laughs> <laughs> the only way they're going to sit and listen to you is if somebody gets a gift at the end of the whole thing. So who, 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 which question did you like the most from our little chat? Uh, I might have to... I've forgotten what they were. Well, the one you said at the start, you, like, you like the question about um, about post production on He Dreams of Giants. You said that's the best question. You like that? Yeah, that, yes, I did it. I, so I said it. You, I'm glad you're awake here. So we'll give it. We'll I, give it. To I, I'll give that the question. I'll, I'll say. I'll give that one. I'll have. Maybe I've got to draw something Quixote-esque somehow. I think that'd be amazing. I'm sure Yvonne, who, who asked that question, would really appreciate. Right. <laughs> Listen, Terry, thank you so much for making thank time you. to chat to the students no, no. to answer their questions. And well, uh, I hope I've discouraged a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks again. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye, world. <laughs>